Honourable Members, the Employment and Equality Tribunal last week published a decision in a case about which there is considerable public concern. The case is still sub judice and is likely to be so for several weeks to come. As a rule, questions are not permitted in this Honourable Court about matters which are sub judice subject to the discretion of the President. In practice, the same rule is normally applied to statements. However, in the view of the degree of public concern, I have allowed Chief Minister to make a short statement. I have asked the Chief Minister to avoid commenting on the case itself, which is still a matter for the Tribunal, but to concentrate on future government action, which <coughs> is properly a matter for Timbald. When it comes to questions on the statement, I will allow questions on the Chief Minister's future proposals, but I will not allow questions on any of the past events which have been examined by the Tribunal. I would also remind honourable members that questions on a statement are questions. They are not an opportunity to make speeches. I call on the Chief Minister. Mr President, the recent judgment determined by the Employment Tribunal in favour of Dr Rosalind Ranson has made uncomfortable reading for many people and has regrettably not reflected well on the professionalism of our public service. As you have said, Mr President, our legal advice is that this case remains sub judice as various matters still need to be determined and settled by the Tribunal. I am therefore unable to discuss in any detail many aspects of the Tribunal's findings at this stage. Mr President, the judgment from the Employment Tribunal was clear, and I quote, this decision is not an investigation in any way into in which the Manx Government handled the COVID-19 pandemic neither is it concerned with the issues or merits of the vaccination programme. I agree and would respectfully suggest to honourable members that these specific issues will be dealt with by the independent review into the COVID pandemic. I can assure honourable members that we are working hard to find a suitable chair so that all pandemic actions can be brought to public attention as soon as possible. However, this tribunal has raised a number of substantive questions regarding government performance and culture, and has understandably damaged confidence in government, I stand today to acknowledge the deep discomfort that we feel with the evidence and findings of this tribunal, and I acknowledge our shortcomings. In our island plan, we set out the absolute need for a one government approach, an approach that requires everyone across the public service to have certain considerations at the forefront of public service delivery. Our culture should be one of people first. We are determined to deliver the best quality of life for our people. The Island Plan states this requires key principles to be embedded across all of government. We have already clearly stated those as listening, strategic thinking, stewardship, prioritisation, productivity, delivery and accountability. I have already made clear our commitments that government departments, boards and officers will be required to develop clear action plans in fulfilment of their objectives, ensure cohesion on cross-government working methods and policies, and produce an annual report for Timwell debate, <coughs> scrutiny and approval, led by the Minister or the Chairperson. These plans will include specific actions and measures of performance. As part of our approach, to reforming culture, capability and performance. It is vital that honourable members in this court have the chance to hold government to account and to determine whether productivity and performance is of the standard required. That is what we have already committed to. But it is not enough. It is clear that we need to do more now and we need to do it faster to ensure that our vision becomes reality. Therefore, I am today announcing a series of actions that will start a process of fundamental and wide-ranging reform across the public sector. In light of the retirement of the Chief Secretary, I am taking the opportunity to reflect on its position, its roles and its responsibilities. This is now the moment to consider how the Chief Secretary enables and leads the highest standards of professionalism and performance across government. We will also consider whether changes need to be made to ensure better accountability and delivery of government plans and departmental performances. 
In assessing these matters, there will need to be a determination on structural reform, including single legal entity matters. I will update Tinwald in October on the role of the Chief Secretary and associated structural implications. <coughs> we will now undertake a review into the Office of Human Resources and its effectiveness. It is vital that departments are being given full and proper advice in respect of the fair treatment of staff. I will announce how this will be undertaken by the end of this month. It is clear that governance, performance and standards need improvement. The Council of Ministers has already discussed the idea of non-executive ministerial advisers and indeed the DOI Minister has appointed such to assist and advise him. We will produce and release codes of governance for the appointment now of such non-executives to departmental boards to provide more challenging levels of advice and scrutiny to government performance. These will be laid before Tinwald in July. Appointing such will be at the discretion of the Minister, but in, but in appointing non-executives, I must be clear that policy will be decided by Council of Ministers and political members alone, with advice from officials. Board advisers will be in place to give advice and support on the operational implications and effectiveness of policy proposals, focusing on getting policy translated into results. They will operate according to recognised precepts of good corporate governance in business, leadership, effectiveness, accountability and sustainability. Enhanced departmental boards need to be able to challenge, advise on and supervise five main areas – strategic clarity, commercial sense, talented people, results and management information. Across the whole of government, the Code of, for Public Servants last updated in January 2017 will be reviewed and updated. We will be accelerating the actions agreed by Tinwald in February 2021 on whistleblowing, including updates to the policies which have been drafted following internal consultation. Over the summer, we will be consulting on proposed new legislation to strengthen our approach, including enhancing protected disclosures, as well as bringing forward revised and mandatory training for everyone on an ongoing basis. It is clear to me that organisational culture needs to be refreshed and revitalised. Across parts of the organisation, we are failing to properly engage and listen with our workforce. The Island Plan focuses on the principles of government and people first, but it is silent on organisational values such as hard work, commitment and integrity. In focusing so much on delivery, we have perhaps forgotten that in order to do so, we need to build the best teams and create an employment environment where hard work is acknowledged and rewarded where people are listened to and where people are empowered to achieve. Here, here. There is too much top-down management and not enough bottom-up problem-solving or listening. We will set out today to renew, refresh and revitalise the government's organisational culture and performance through greater transparency, better communications and by insisting that solutions are delivered by proper engagement across the structure. We will therefore, in conjunction with the review into HR, launch an employee engagement programme over the summer to bring to the fore the core values of the organisation, determine how better organisational communications can take place, how productivity can be improved, and we will publish by December the outcomes of this programme and its future impact and related actions. We cannot successfully deliver without our staff and employees operating to the highest standards. But in order to achieve that, they themselves must be enabled to achieve and have trust in the organisation. We must do more to recognise success, but we must also do more when there are recognised failings. In that vein, the Council of Ministers will introduce by the end of this year an employee recognition programme across the government to enhance and promote good performance and culture. Vice versa, the Council of Ministers will also bring forward a protocol that will allow for either a part or whole of a department to be put into a special measures programme where Council believes there is substantial evidence of failings. Moving on, I can inform the Court that the SAVE programme, commissioned by the Treasury over the period 2017 to 2019, will now receive a renewed and urgent attention. Government is too big and unwieldy. Operations in government must now be annexed into the appropriate structures to bring about proper governance and transparency. The Council of Ministers will bring forward further proposals on this in October. Mr President, I acknowledge our failings. 
we need to make changes to government, structural changes, cultural changes and organisational changes because we cannot retain the status quo. And we need to do it now to ensure that the public are getting the best possible outcomes and delivery. I recognise, of course, that so many public servants do so much to deliver the very best in public services. But there have now been too many issues over the years to feel comfortable. We must now all take responsibility. <coughs> Change will not happen overnight, but we must start and we must move with urgency. The Council of Ministers are determined to ensure that change does happen. Today I am laying out foundations. There is more to come. Delivering will not be easy, but I know and believe that with effort and determination, the government and its staff <coughs> can strive to become a more focused, professional and streamlined organisation. Here, here. Yeah. Turn to questions. I call on the Honourable Lorder. Good morning, and can I thank the Chief Minister for his statement, which uh, contains an awful lot um, that's, relatively speaking, come out of the blue, and I support his focus on rebuilding broken trust. Will the Chief Minister firstly accept that there is a need for perhaps a general debate at the earliest possible opportunity for members uh, to feed into this process uh, as soon as possible after the end of the subjudice period on this so that this case can be used along with others so that members can contribute their thoughts and experiences and help shape the future of the public service in light of recent events? Um, in terms of the, the ongoing view into the, the new review into OHR and others, um, will that include recruitment processes um, such as those that allow a megalomaniac to end up running the Department of Health and Social Care? Um, will it also um, look at making sure that there are ethical standards that can be objectively upheld across uh, government as well? Um, will this Will the reviews that the Chief Minister has announced cross the political divide? Because one of the things that is also quite apparent here that there is a need for training, there is a need for better governance, um, there is a need for better quality decision making in the, on the political side of decision making, and also whether the political <coughs> structures are appropriate to hold senior officers to account. Because yeah. at the moment, my experience certainly is that they are not, and that is something that is very much in, in need of focus. So, Chief Minister, would care to answer those? Chief Minister to reply. Uh, just first of all, I mean, I, I will bring forward the full uh, scope and terms and how that uh, HR review is being undertaken. That, that really fundamentally lies about making sure that departments are being given the proper, appropriate HR advice when it comes to personnel issues. Mr. President, across an organisation of 7,500 or so full time equivalent employees, that I think it is unrealistic to expect there will not be issues um, from time to time. Um, but it, the most important thing is those matters are being dealt with professionally and appropriately. And in accordance with that, it's right that managers and staff have the right advice uh, being given to them and that that advice is being given in a proper, fair and, and, and impartial manner to ensure that people are being given the uh, appropriate opportunities uh, and, and chances in, in those situations. So that fundamentally needs to, to uh, be addressed and we need to reach out across the organisation to understand how that interaction is working with HR and to review overall the performance levels of, of human, the Office of Human Resources in that context. So that's, that's that uh, question I, I hope compartmentalised and I will update. And then I'll, moving on to the, to the, to the issue of the, the, the political question which you've said, will we reach out across the political divide? I think it's imperative that, that we do so now, Mr Speaker. I think there are two uh, critical issues um, around that. First and foremost, I think around the governance from the centre in terms of the role of the Chief Secretary. Uh, I acknowledge the contribution of, of Mr Greenhow whilst I am on my feet. I welcome the appointment, the interim appointment of uh, Mr Randall. But it is important that we get on now um, and work out what actually needs to be done in the context of <coughs> that um, position vis-a-vis -vis what implications that might have across government, government. and of course there is of course an element, um, would you rightly say, of political governance um, around departments. I think partly that is why we're also um, bringing forward now um, uh, the, the, the guidance for the appointment um, of outside professionals, the terms on which they would be appointed. I will bring those to Timwald and I hope that process by bringing those to Timwald as well uh, Mr Speaker, will allow you and this Honourable Court to have a further contribution around how departments themselves are managing their min departments and ministers are, are properly managing um, their affairs. Honourable Member, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to thank the Chief Minister for the statement. 
but I would like to ask him to go further and focus on the key issue here. The time has arrived for an independent review of the current division between political members and civil servants. A me mechanism needs to be identified which provides the political member with a political memory and a clear route to effectively have an additional assessment made of any CEO or senior civil servant advice. What we have here for the first time is a clear chink of light which highlights how easy it is for a competent CEO to effectively manipulate a very efficient minister and departmental members. In summary, I would like an independent review to be actioned into the current relationship which exists between political members and the civil service. Unless this is done, this type of situation will continue to be easy to repeat and this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to rebalance the system will have gone. Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. I think uh, somewhat, Mr President, uh, I will give Tim will the opportunity to do that by bringing forward, as I've just suggested to, to the Speaker, those governance codes around the appointment of non-executive ministerial advisers, the structure in which they are being appointed, the, the framework in which boards should operate. Uh, and, and I agree, I think there is a call to improve the uh, oversight mechanisms um, in certain areas. I think I'll leave it at that, Mr. President. I've acknowledged that. We've got proposals on the table. I'll bring it forward in July, and the Honourable Member can pick up at that point. Honourable Member, Mrs. Kane. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the Chief Minister for his statement. While he found deep discomfort and acknowledged the shortcomings, I, didn't, I was angry and incredulous as page after page of revelations. And although there is clear undertaking here, to fix, to have a reset of organisational culture. There was no real hint of regret or apology. I wonder where the Chief Minister, given the findings already, sits on that. But in terms of fixing the culture and the organisational structure of government, he mentioned annexing um, departments into place. I wonder if he could expand what his vision is for this annexing and streamlining of government. And also, will the necessary people be put in place to manage that culture change, because that can't happen to be absorbed in the existing workforce, I would think. Thank you, Mr. President. Honourable Members, uh, I will not allow the Chief Minister to comment on the first part of that uh, question, which is subjudice, but certainly uh, offer a comment on the latter part. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Uh, President. Um, I think, uh, I, I, think I, have, I think it is important that I indicate to this House that, that there is uh, work being focused um, on uh, some elements of structural reform within government. I've said that we will bring that back in October. I think it is important that we have a streamlined organisation. I've heard the calls for change. Uh, we recognise that culturally, performance-wise, productivity-wise, we need to create the best environment where our workforce, our staff are properly engaged, motivated and feel free to contribute um, to uh, policy and the creation um, of, 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 of not only policy but also delivery and are also in a position, I think, to raise concerns where those concerns are needed and they need to be able to feel uh, their ability to do that without fear or favour. Um, and that is, that is the structure. I've set out the, re the, the reform process. I've acknowledged that, that we are going to get on with that fundamental essence now um, of changing the culture within government. And alongside that, there is also a case to present a more streamlined organisation. And our, our, as I said, we will look at the contents of the SAVE report, which is a, a very public document, and Council intends to bring forward where it perceives there to be improvements in terms of organisational structures in October. The Honourable Member, Mr Glover. Good morning, Dr. Ann. I welcome the statement from the Chief Minister. Um, in his statement, he mentioned the Employee Recognition Programme <coughs> to enhance and promote good performance and culture. I'm just questioning how Council of Ministers are going to have any credibility in bringing that forward when one of the members of the Council of Ministers <coughs> is part of the story. Chief Minister, to reply. I, I think we're all part of the story, Mr. President. I'm afraid you cannot, you cannot escape. There are many issues that are substantive 
governmental-wide issues um, are uh, something that we all have to take responsibility for. So on that basis, uh, as I outlined in my speech now, we need to work on delivering the best outcomes for our people. There are so many challenges facing this government, including a substantial cost of living crisis. It is time that we all recognised that as well as uh, changing culture, uh, addressing some of the uh, professionalism issues and creating a better, more streamlined, more focused uh, outcome for our people, we also have many other issues that require us to give thought to policy and appropriate policy in order to meet these grave challenges that are now facing us. Call the Honourable Member, Mr Callister. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and I also thank the Chief Minister for his um, statement this morning. I also fully support and endorse the comments from the Speaker in respect of ongoing training for civil servants and ministers and political members, and I look forward to seeing that framework in due course. Can I ask uh, the Chief Minister if it's possible today to give us further sort of comments and share his vision on, in respect of the review of the Chief Secretary role. Does he have any thoughts of what direction that should take and how that role should adapt in the future? Thank you. Chief Minister to reply. I don't think I've got time, actually, Mr. President. <laughs> I think you'll probably stop me. But I, I think the acknowledgement uh, to the Honourable Member that, this, uh, that we should also um, accept that there now um, are opportunities to change um, and to look forward. Um, the role of the <coughs> Chief Secretary at the very heart of government is something that needs close, close examination. I would not like to uh, jump to conclusions or, or predicate that in any way. Suffice to say, I, as I assured the Speaker, I will make sure that we reach out across the political divide to understand where honourable members also feel that that, that role could be enhanced um, and approved. And I will bring uh, the full, full, as I said, full, full process at the latest in terms of bring, coming back to, to Timwald in October to report as to where we, are exact, where, where we are exactly with that process, but by then I hope that an engagement programme would have already under, been undertaken. <clears throat> Come on, the Honourable Member, Mr August Hansen. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I also welcome this statement, and, and clearly um, this has been taken very seriously, so I take great comfort in that. Um, understanding sort of the need for a very, very urgent reform regarding um, the um, review of, of OHR, um, do you think that perhaps it may be a little bit too soon that you um, report back at, um, or report into Timberwolf members at the end of this month? Um, because I would expect that perhaps the, the council ministers would want to take external advice um, on that matter um, to ensure that they're getting um, the, the best possible um, outline framework or plan or um, understanding of what that might look like. Thank you, Mr. President. Chief Minister to reply. I think there is a sense of urgency with this, and I think that uh, all, all my commitment was that I would uh, report as to how this was going to be undertaken, not not um, not, not the very specifics of, of every granular detail, but simply how how we would propose to roll this um, this this review of OHR out. So I assure the honourable member that, that we will give considered thought as to what we're actually seeking to achieve. And please bear in mind there were also a number of other announcements. Um, around that in terms of our engagement uh, across, the, across the public sector and some of those uh, engagement processes, including reaching out to our, to our staff, I hope will help contribute to how OHR in the future can better contribute um, as, well, as well as instilling uh, better values that I hope we can all buy into uh, as an organisation and create the right culture that we're looking to do so. Call on the Honourable Member, Mrs Christian. Thank you, <coughs> Mr President. Um, I'd also like to thank the Chief Minister for his swift and prompt comments in the press and in this honourable court today. This administration will be defined by the results of the action taken to drive bad culture out from within the ranks of our civil service and politics. We need to shake this tree once and for all for bad apples and show the people of the Isle of Man that this government knows the true meaning of integrity. Mr President, as Max Dupree said, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality, which brings me to my questions. I'd like to ask the Chief Minister, firstly, if he has confidence in the ability of the former DHSC Minister, the now Treasury Minister, in the role of his duty as a Minister. And does he believe that the former Minister, DHSC Minister, has misled this Honourable Court at any time? Two, does the Chief Minister have confidence in the Director of Public Health in her duty of her role? Three, does the Chief Minister have confidence in the DHSC 
and the OHR's ability to uphold fairness and works policy. Four, does the Chief Minister believe that a chain of command is a system which should only be used for giving instructions to enhance productivity and should not be used as a reason to disregard opinions and information from employees? Does the Chief Minister agree with me that disadvantages of adhering to such a system would encourage less collaboration, slow decision making and communication and decreased employment empowerment and as such has no place where fundamental decisions need to be made when lives are at risk. Five, could the Chief Minister confirm if Mrs Magson paid Manx tax and national insurance during her two member, years of member, employment? That, 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 that's disallowed. Uh, you've had four questions. I think the last two minutes. To, to, please, I have my final question. Uh, please, please resume your seat. Regarding You'll have an opportunity in a moment, uh, Mrs. Christian. There are four questions that have been asked. Uh, one question now regarding an employee, which I will not allow, and I'll ask the Chief Minister to respond to those other three. And I will come back to you, Mrs. Christian. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, look, as I said to you, with regards to um, the Minister and the Ministers, we are getting on with delivering for the people of this island. We are facing a substantial cost of living crisis, and it's important that we roll out the right appropriate approach in order to support our people through what is going to be the most challenging of times. The Treasury Minister has already brought forward a package of support appropriate um, to the uh, rise in, in energy uh, and fuel bills. Uh, and I can tell you now that as a council we are continuing to consider how best we can support uh, our people on this island through uh, the forthcoming months, which clearly are going to pre present sub substantial challenges. In terms of the performance of senior officers, uh, all senior officers continue to be reviewed and assessed as to uh, their overall performance and indeed we are looking at how that can be enhanced and that is one of the reasons that I have brought forward those proposals regarding boards uh, and I think that when we have that debate I would suggest to the Honourable Member that interaction between senior staff uh, and the, the uh, politicians and the overall government's um, performance levels of capability uh, will need to be, be uh, significantly looked at. I'm not, uh, Mr. President, going to start delving into senior uh, individual performances on the floor of Timwald, but I assure honourable members that all uh, capability um, of senior officers <coughs> now is uh, under review in terms of understanding how we can continue to better assess it and indeed whether they are in fact undertaking the full spectrum uh, of their public duties appropriately. In terms of uh, the chain of um, command and, and the way things are working, I think, Mr President, uh, I think some of this will come out. I think partly some of the issues she referred to will be a matter for the COVID inquiry. I've already suggested that we shouldn't really want to examine in depth what specifically happened during COVID, but we should wait for the Chair to, uh, to bring forward proposals. But I do accept that in the wake um, of this tribunal and uh, in the wake of the findings um, and in the wake of what's happened over the last two years, there may well be uh, a need, and I think we recognise that, a need, a need to perhaps change and refocus our emphasis in terms of our culture and the way that we engage as, a, as, as an organisation with our employees. I've made that perfectly clear during this statement, and that's uh, my position. Honourable Members, um, Chief Minister has made this statement. I just want to make it very clear this is about asking questions. Uh, I'd ask you to keep those concise. You can ask multiple questions at uh, different times. So I now call on Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. This has been the third big issue casting a shadow of our, our healthcare system in recent days. I'm generally concerned about the key workers, and I recognise why so many of them are really worried about what has happened and what could happen again. Can the Chief Minister please provide some reassurance for every member of staff in the DHSC and Manx Care this morning? Their voices will be heard and reassurance is definitely required. Thank you, Mr President. Chief Minister to reply. Mr President, indeed, I, I, I understand actually that uh, in, light of my, you know, in lieu of my commitments for a full-scale employee engagement programme, that engagement, employee engagement programme is in fact actually currently being rolled out um, across uh, Manx Care. <coughs> I would also say this, 
um, Mr. President, that um, we all acknowledge that the health care, uh, that the NHS has been under considerable strain and pressure, that there are many issues that need um, resolution. Um, and that you know, we have recently gone through a significant period of change, both in terms of the pressures that COVID has applied to the National Health Service and also um, as a result of the, the change in organisational um, structure with the appointment of Manx Care. But, but I would also um, ask the Court to consider that many issues um, have been around for many years. And in fact, um, in fact going back five or six years, uh, the National Health Service was in a substantial period um, of flux and indeed many members of this honourable court were uh, in fact insisted on uh, a full external examination um, of the health service at that time. The creation of Manx Care uh, is a step forward, a step change in order to try and create a better more productive um, organisation. It is tough but I would say to, to honourable members, uh, uh, sorry to, to employees in the healthcare service, they too um, are being included within the scope of our, uh, our requirement to change culture, to listen to employees um, throughout the service, to have the proper contribution uh, in order to ensure that they are empowered, um, to, to ensure that, that the public are getting the very, very best uh, in public service delivery and that they too play a role in solving the many, many problems that face uh, the health service and indeed the public service when we come to delivering the outcomes required from our island plan. Call the Honourable Member, Ms Farragher. Director Ren, and um, thank you to the Chief Minister for his statement, which is reassuring in many ways. Um, this is a crisis of key importance for this administration and the public's perception of and trust in this government. We've heard in the Chief Minister's statement that change needs to happen, with which I wholeheartedly agree, but we didn't hear any reassurance that we'll see some accountability I do have um, a number of questions, so I will just ask one um, in accordance with your instructions, Dr. Wren. Um, firstly, we are bound by the Code of Conduct for Timbald members. So paying particular attention to the seven principles of public life, which are selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership. Does the Chief Minister believe that any part of this code has been broken? Thank you. Chief Minister to reply. I'm quite content for that to uh, uh, be not permitted, given the uh, direction of, the, of that question. I would give Ms Farragher an opportunity to now ask a second question uh, at this time, as you had multiple. Um, can the Chief Minister tell us what actions will be taken in the short term to address the culture of impunity that seems to prevail in the upper echelons of government? I'll give Chief Minister an opportunity here. I think, uh, as I've said to honourable members, um, it is important that the organisation takes responsibility, that we take responsibility. I have stood up this morning to acknowledge our shortcomings <coughs> and to acknowledge the need for change. I've already pointed out to honourable members that the opportunity for that now exists, that we will indeed be uh, looking to deliver, deliver that through key, two key areas. First, a full and proper examination of the central leadership function and what that actually means for, for good governance uh, and the higher standards of professionalism. Secondly, um, through the uh, proposed appointment now of an, an enhanced governance structure that will support ministers and politicians in terms of the way that they go about uh, working with senior officers um, to achieve and, of course, uh, more generally, a proper engagement programme with our workforce to bring forward the core values. There is a need for absolute change, uh, Mr President. I've made that absolutely clear this morning. I have the highest respect for the way that many of our public servants go about our, their business, but there is no doubt that the findings of this tribunal have substantial implications and we are going to set about this morning addressing those and changing things for the better for the public and for the government. On the Honourable Member, Mr Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, and the questions I ask are now are constrained by previous questions and also by the um, spirit in which this statement has been made and the way that questions have been answered. 
The first question I have is uh, a sort of olive branch uh, to the Chief Minister, which is that uh, today he's talked about doing lots of things, would, and, and people have asked what that means in practice. Would it be fair to say that we're going back to the Public Service Reform Progress Report preparing for the future in January 2020, where many of the measures that are, uh, have been outlined today are actually laid down after the committee that, that met with Mrs Kane, Mrs Barber and myself and a couple of others were involved. Secondly, um, the Chief Minister today has mentioned uh, the, the Nolan principles and governance codes. Does the Chief Minister agree with me it is a cry and shame that we haven't updated the Nolan Principles since 2017, especially given how much they've changed. And does he now agree with me that uh, the crucial ones, as he makes up his mind about politicians and managers, and as government makes up their mind about politicians and leaders, to remember objectivity, which is that holders of public office must act and take decisions impartially, <coughs> fairly, and on merit, using the best evidence, Secondly, honesty. Holders of public office should be truthful. And thirdly, leadership. Holders of public office should exhibit those principles in their own behaviours and treat others with respect. The third question I would like to ask is about the um, Public Services Commission, because what uh, strikes me in 2020 and 2021 is a, the potential of a lack of action in all of these areas from somebody like the Public Services Commission, which would seem to have the, um, the characteristics and the opportunities to do something about this much uh, earlier. And finally, the fourth question is, can the Chief Minister offer any comment in respect of the work of Tim Wald? Uh, Tim Wald seems to be remarkably absent from the statement. It's all about going back to the 80s and 90s and putting uh, politicians around um, inside the departments, around the, the, the officer decision makers. But you know, it has been difficult um, for Tim Wald in the last couple of years. And I just ask one question: Is the Chief Minister happy that the um, Public Accounts Committee? ministers, for instance, who heard evidence from at least two of those individuals who are involved, have been able to handle themselves properly subsequent to the, um, subsequent to the, uh, out, the events that were going on and the outturn. Chief Minister, before you respond there, there is, uh, I think, five questions in total there. The second question regarding the public service is the same as Ms Farragher, so I will not allow that, but uh, leave you to answer the remaining questions. Well, I think the um, Honourable Member has just risen to his feet and talked about going back. We're not going back, Mr President. We have to go forward. And that is the vital message that we need to take. Now, whether there is some correlation in going forward to what has happened in the past, then, then that is life. There are only so many cycles within an organisation. But the point is we have to move forward. At points, there are chances to renew, revitalise and refresh an organisation. That opportunity is with us today. We should not worry about the past to the extent that things may or, or, or may not have been written down. I think that what we need to do is focus on achieving better outcomes now and moving things forward. There is a clear need to improve account, uh, governance and accountability. I absolutely accept that. We need to have that conversation. We're going to have that conversation um, in July. There is a clear need to update codes and principles. I've committed to that and that statement. I agree. It is unfortunate that they were last reviewed in 2017, but we're going to get on to renew and refresh those uh, principles and the codes uh, of conduct um, again. In terms of the Public Services Commission, uh, I agree, uh, and I believe the, the Cabinet Office Minister will agree with me, that the, the role of the Public Service Commission also needs to be um, examined as well. And finally, Mr. Mr President, the Honourable Member talks about Tim Wald. Tim Wald uh, has a role. I have actually mentioned Tim Wald in my statement. I told the Honourable Member in the Island Plan there was a clear commitment for us to engage with Tim Wald, not behind closed doors, not with presentations, openly, transparently, ministers on the floor delivering their department's plans alongside the, their, their plans for productivity and indeed, dare I say it, the way their departments are operating and being managed and to accept whatever comes from the floor. So Tinwald has an absolute vital role to play here. I said we, 
I do believe that includes everybody within this honourable court in terms of the role that they and the responsibilities that they themselves also have to play. On the honourable member, Mr. Callister. And thank you, Mr. President. I would like to go back on the role and the review of the Chief Secretary, if possible. I, if I heard the Chief Minister correct, he said that he would be reporting back to this court in October. Given everything that we're going through since we've been re-elected in September last year, I know we have a very competent interim Chief Secretary in post, but is it fair to actually hold back the advertisement and the appointment of a Chief Secretary to the end of this, the, this year and possibly going into next year? We need to get this resolved. Can you give reassurance of when that um, the post will be advertised and when that position will be filled? Thank you. Chief Minister to reply. I think that, uh, Honourable Member, I think it is important that we have an engagement process and that we do have a period um, of reflection and we do have the opportunity to reach out across multiple parties but indeed across the, the, the political spectrum. That process takes time. I, I would also um, say I've made the commitment that I would come back um, in October to give, us, to give Tim Ward um, the latest information in terms of the progress of that. I hope that we've actually achieved a position whereby uh, Tim Ward will agree with uh, any future structural um, changes around um, the Chief Secretary. But nevertheless, we'll be back in October. We will not stand still. We will be reaching out imminently to try and effect a proper process of engagement to ensure that that role is uh, properly looked at. I would point out, though, uh, Mr President, as well to honourable members, <coughs> You know, in engaging in quite substantial commitments to start to reform culture. This will not happen overnight. And we also need to be mindful of the substantial challenges facing our population at the moment and the critical issues around service delivery that they uh, are experiencing, the cost of living crisis that many of them are, are feeling. And uh, I want to assure the public that, yes, this will become a priority for government, but we will not take our eye off the ball when it comes to ensuring that we are working in the very best interests of building a more secure, more sustainable island for, for now and indeed for the future. Well, the Honourable Member, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. I fail to see how annual reports will uh, actually reform culture change. But my question is, um, I'm encouraged to hear that there will be employee engagement programme over the summer. Um, could he confirm if this will re reach all areas of the civil service, such as teachers, bus drivers, fire, police, etc.? And actually, which department will be overall responsible for this? Will it be OHR, who themselves will be under review, or will this be Cabinet Office or the departments? But who's going to overall look at this? Thank you, Mr President. Chief Minister to reply. Uh, I confirm that it, uh, it is my intention that that reaches out across the uh, public sector, not just to civil servants, but to everybody uh, who is engaged um, in delivering frontline services and indeed those who are supporting behind the scenes. And it's, uh, it's vital that we make sure it is it's properly run. And I uh, informed the honourable member that I would update um, this court uh, by the end of this month as to how we plan to do that and, and included in that as to who effectively would be uh, running that um, programme. Call on the Honourable Member, Dr Hayward. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I welcome the statement from the Chief Minister this morning. I wonder if you'd like to comment, because although we briefly sort of touched on, on Tim Wald, I think the change in culture that is required, while it won't be overnight, is actually symptomatic of a culture that has persisted within this House as well. Uh, po as politicians, we all come from different backgrounds with varying levels of exper expertise in different subjects, and so we rely on our civil servants to give us decent information and evidence to, to make decisions on. But in order to evaluate that and to act as an effective uh, political body, we need to embed in our way of thinking leadership and critical thinking skills. And I don't think that those are embedded across this House with all parties. And uh, that's no you know, derogation to any, any member that's here. How do you intend to address the deficit that we obviously have had politi collectively, politically, for years, yeah. and how will that work forward for us? Chief Minister, to reply. Well, I think par partly, partly, Mr. President, I, I think I do go back to partly the, 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 the view, my view, that the opportunity should be given to ministers and, and, and political representatives to enhance the advice that they are getting when they are sitting down at top level within their boards and, and departments um, for meetings 
um, so that, that we have that uh, ability for some independent commercial experience and, and advice because no matter how much training um, is given, you cannot beat that type of uh, high-level ex expertise um, and experience. So that's, that's my first point. I think, secondly, when talking about um, the development um, of uh, individuals, uh, I think it is a fair point. Um, I, I've, uh, in fact, I think the speaker was pressing me on, on this issue. Um, and you know, there is, uh, in the back of the field here, a, a plan to try and help uh, ministers um, develop their abilities and, and, and skills when um, running departments. But uh, I feel that this should now be a focus in terms of our uh, employee uh, engagement programme, indeed our engagement programme across Timwald. Um, and we will need to look and understand as to how we can better uh, help ministers and help departmental members understand the scope of their roles um, and be an ability to perhaps better understand how they can gather um, the advice that's been given and, and reach the appropriate decisions. Call on the Honourable Member, Mr Glover. Guru Maya, Dr Ann. Obviously we're looking to help the culture and performance of the civil service and I think it's uh, important just to re-emphasise that we do have most civil servants who are very conscientious and hard-working and very diligent. It's getting rid of the bad apples. But I do worry that Council of Ministers is going into this not unblemished themselves. There used to be a culture of politicians doing the right thing and stepping down when they became the story. Surely for this review to have more chance of success, you need a clean sheet, Chief Minister. Chief Minister, to reply. This is not about a review, Mr. President. This is about taking actions that are, are meaningful um, for the, the, the future. And, and I also need to point out, honourable members keep mentioning civil servants. We have, a, you know, I think we need to talk about one government across the public sector um, because this is not just a, a, an issue for um, the civil service. I think we all need to um, engage and recognise that uh, there are various areas I think where we could do. Um, so much better and we're going to continue um, to do that. I think that we have the platform now, the opportunity now uh, and we need to find um, the right uh, uh, structures and, and engagement process to achieve what I've set out this morning as, as the way forward and I go back and I emphasise before in terms of this governance and in terms of this idea of ministerial leadership I think when, you bring, when I bring forward these, these codes then Tim will have a better uh, position to be able to um, understand how the role um, of the ministers will be affected moving forward. Honourable Member, Mr Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Chief Minister for his statement. The emerging economic situation will make some of the plans and pledges within the island plan more challenging to achieve. But regardless of the economic climate, nationally or internationally, and regardless of all the day-to-day -day challenges, does the Chief Minister <coughs> recognise that his government has the opportunity to do something fundamental, and that is to put in place the culture, mechanism and policies to ensure individuals across the public sector have the confidence to speak out <coughs> safely about all questionable practice and procedure? And would the Chief Minister also agree that an administration that commands greater public trust will have achieved a great deal indeed? Yeah. Yeah. Chief Minister to reply? Yes. And yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, call on Ms Farragher. Um, I think one thing we should all agree upon is the importance of freedom of the press in our democracy. Will the Chief Minister undertake to investigate exactly how and why both senior civil servants and elected representatives made attempts to lean on at least one media outlet to silence his story when it initially broke? I, I won't allow that. That's on past uh, proceedings there. So we'll now move on to Honourable Member, Mr Thomas. Uh, thank you, um, Mr President. And I'm building on the, uh, that, the idea of, um, of trust and the opposite to that, would, which might be disappointment that the, the government and ourselves as public representatives need to have with the people we represent. So the first question is that um, there are people out there already who think that the Chief Minister is missing the elephant in the room they're disappointed, they think this is all a waste of time. So can the Chief Minister assure those people that culture means addressing fairness at work 
addressing the fact that protected disclosures have been used against people unfairly and that managers and politicians need to be accountable. And secondly, does the Ch Chief Minister want to agree with me that there's no point denying the past? Chief Minister, I'll allow you to answer that generally, but not the specifics. I think I've told um, the Honourable Member it's not about denying the past, but this is about focusing on moving forward and finding the right mechanisms now, um, the right processes to bring about uh, the reform that we now all want to see. And um, in terms of uh, whistleblowing, I was clear in my statement that we will be accelerating the actions agreed by Tim Ward in February 2021 on whistleblowing, including updates to the policies which have been drafted following internal consultation. Over this summer, we will be consulting on proposed re new proposed legislation to strengthen our approach, including enhanced protected disclosures, as well as bringing forward revised and mandatory training for everyone on a regular basis. Call on the Honourable Member, Mr Wannenberg. Thank you, Mr President. Two of my Honourable Colleagues have mentioned the Nolan Principle, something which the Chief Minister has not done. Does he does he agree that he should embed these principles in our processes and for failure to do that could lead to serious reputational damage? <coughs> and in applying, in applying these principles, would the Chief Minister agree that this would also eliminate systemic negative behaviours and a culture of intimidation and bullying which has been prevalent? Lessons learned really are. But could I ask for a commitment from the Chief Minister? Does his government have the political will, the capacity even? to instill good governance throughout? And does he recognise that both my constituents and the wider public, the overburdened taxpayers who so often pick up the tab, <clears throat> have simply had enough of words and platitudes, and that the fundamental issues he has identified in his speech, the meaningful actions, the so-called recalib recalibration, will finally be addressed? Thank you. Can I allow a general answer there, Chief Minister? Uh, yes, I think the Nolan principles are embedded in public life already, and we're going to continue to build to build on those um, principles when we review the codes as committed to in my um, statement. I think it is important that we uh, move now to recognise failings when they exist in government. I do not want to suggest for one moment that bullying and intimidation is rife across government, but I do acknowledge that this inquiry has brought to light behaviours that we have all found uncomfortable uh, and unprofessional. We are setting out today, Mr President, the platform for us to renew, refresh and revitalise this government, to bring about changes to culture and to bring about uh, a, wholesome, a more wholesome uh, organisation where employees feel safe and are, feel part of the solutions um, rather than part of the problem. Honourable members, we are going to come to a close. I do have five members who will be asking questions. Next up is Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Chief Minister if the current divide between the political role and the operational role can be reassessed. As a departmental member, when the tribunal began, I had three possible routes to resolve my concerns. Mr Morehouse, that would be sub judice. Um, so. Um, Would you, is there a different question you'd like to pose? Is, is that over, over, overview just in terms of the way the political member can operate within any department? With any department, there's that option of talking to the CEO. You cannot refer to your time as in, when you're yeah, in the I'll, department. I'll uh, create a gap between that the two. That's yeah. So we're not to have a debate. You've asked the question. I'll ask you now to re resume your seat and Chief Minister to ask, answer that question. Thank you. Yes, I've already talked about the issue um, of the, the interaction with politicians. It is time for that to be uh, reviewed. Um, I hope I provided some platform for that to uh, be enabled. And of course, it is perfectly uh, um, uh, understandable if a select committee or if a uh, Timwald committee wishes to examine um, this matter in greater detail. But we will be enabled to have that debate when I bring forward the codes to bring forward non-executive ministerial advisers on to boards, related boards of central government departments. Call the Honourable Member, Mrs Christian. 
Thank you, Mr. President. As you can see, we've got the eyes and ears with us today. Um, so perhaps the Chief Minister could um, confirm, with regards to whistleblowing, this acceleration that he's talking about. Who is currently leading this committee? If somebody had a case that they wanted to bring forward as of today, who would they go to? Because it's all very fair and well that we're going to strengthen the policy after the summer or during the summer, but what about now? And also, secondly, what does concern me is that he says he doesn't want to go back, but what happens about the peoples whose lives have been destroyed in the past and time has elapsed. How will we be looking at what we've done in the past and making that right? Thank you, Mr President. Honourable Members, this is about the future of government action. Chief Minister to reply. Well, uh, Mr President, if the Honourable Member looks uh, on, all, uh, uh, on all departments, um, but also on the central government website, there's clear um, guidelines for anybody who wishes to uh, undertake whistleblowing procedures, uh, and those various contact routes are outlined uh, in that documentation. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what she's referring to specifically when we talk about um, looking back, but I think it is important um, for us to recognise our shortcomings, um, but it's also important that we try to move forward uh, and find the right solutions. Uh, rather than bogging ourselves down necessarily in the past, there is an opportunity, and I've said it time and time again, in acknowledging our shortcomings that we find the best solutions to move forward and create a better, uh, more focused, more streamlined uh, organisation in which uh, we can all be proud. Honourable Member, Dr Hayward. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, would the Chief Minister agree that whistleblowing is often a courageous last resort for those who have no other recourse to any other actions and their convictions drive them down a route that will ultimately end their career and um, uh, send them into a spiral that they didn't want to be in? But outside of that, we waste precious staff resources within those departments because if whistleblowing is happening with one person, there will be undoubtedly several others yeah. who as a matter of conscience, leave their post because they can't, con they can't continue with what's going on in their departments. And although you don't want to look backwards, I think there is a real need to look at exit interviews, and I know you're conducting a research, uh, the, the review of the OHR, but to look at why staff have left over the last few years, because actually that will inform where some of that culture was going wrong and what was happening. And I wonder if you would agree that that's quite an important evidence base to examine. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. Chief Minister, to reply. Uh, I do agree, actually. I think that's a very helpful um, point. Uh, I think that um, in undertaking this review into the, into the role of HR, its interaction um, with departments, we do need to get to grips with more, um, to get to grips more, both with the exit process, but also the entry yeah. um, process as well. And that includes the uh, recruitment and the interview process in terms of, of the appointments. But yes, um, we need to work out now how to best capitalise on some of the information that is actually before us, um, and if it's not before us, how we get that information, and to make sure that we are using that as part of a general awareness uh, programme of um, the performance levels uh, of and, and um, employee engagement levels uh, across the organisation. Question, Honourable Lord. Yeah, right. I think that's the appropriate place to finish. Chief Minister, acknowledge uh, within the court today the potential frustration of members of questions that quite rightly have been disallowed today um, and support a general debate on all the issues raised, uh, not just on codes and on non-executives and, and reviews, but on all the issues next month if possible, the month after if not, but as soon as possible after the subjudice cloak has lifted. Thank you. Chief Minister, to reply. Uh, Mr President, I am... Um, happy to acknowledge that a general debate will allow Timwald members to appropriately reflect uh, in more detail on um, this uh, inquiry, um, oh, sorry, on this uh, tribunal uh, uh, in its current position and, and also as to what potentially is to come um, in, in the coming weeks. As to when that actually happens will obviously depend, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, when all matters are, are attached to that. Um, are, are, have been um, concluded and obviously we will look to the appropriate advice from the President and the Speaker as to when that can take place. Thank you.